Hi, I'm Griffin with Oakland County Parks and Recreation's Nature Education Team, and I'd like to thank you for your interest in our Build a Native Pond Neighborhoods Health Program. You should have received a kit already from our Red Oaks Nature Center or our Independence Oaks Contact Station with all of the necessary pieces to build today's Insect Hotel. Now, we have plenty of upcoming programs like this, both in person and virtual, and please check our website and our social media accounts for an updated list of our programs. Now we're going to do two things in this video today. The first is we're going to go over a short PowerPoint about our native pollinators as well as things that we can do to help our pollinators. And then the second half will be constructing our insect hotel, that kit that you picked up from our contact stations or the Red Oaks Nature Center. So let's get started. Thank you for attending our Be a Friend Build a Native Pollinator Hotel program. You should have already received the pieces for a kit either at the Independence Oaks Contact Station or the Wind Nature Center. Um, that'll have all of the pieces necessary to actually build your native pollinator hotel. But before we get to that main part of the program, I just want to go over a little bit about our native pollinators, what a pollinator is, some of the species that you might find in and around your insect hotel, as well as things that we can do in our backyards to help our native pollinators. So, who are pollinators? Well, a pollinator is simply an animal that moves pollen from one flower to another. Now, some of you may have allergies to pollen, that small dust-like substance that flowers produce, but that's actually very important for flowers to reproduce. That pollen, when it gets transferred from one flower to another, will actually result in the creation of seeds, and those seeds will go on to create more of these plants. Some flowers use animals to help get that pollen from one flower to another. And these pollinators, these animals that pollinate, might include things like bees, butterflies, birds, beetles, bats, and many other not as alliterative species. All of these animals will go from one flower of the same species to another, transferring that pollen that those flowers need to reproduce. Not all pollinators are created equal though. Here in Michigan, we have thousands of different species of pollinators, but we have two broad categories, native pollinators and non-native pollinators. A native pollinator is one that's existed in this area for thousands and thousands of years. They have evolved alongside our native plants and have good connections that enable them to be very excellent pollinators for transferring that pollen that these plants need. We also have non-native pollinators, pollinators that didn't evolve in this area and have been brought in from some other place. These pollinators, like the three with the X's on them in this picture, aren't quite as good as our native pollinators. They don't have the same interconnections that our native ones do with the plants that we have here. So why should we care about our pollinators? Pollinators are responsible for pollinating 75% of the world's flowering plants. So if you like in looking at flowers, you like pollinators. Now, pollinators will help to support a bunch of different wildlife too, because not only do pollinators use these plants, but a lot of our other animals enjoy them. For instance, if you like seeing birds, deer, pretty much any type of wildlife, you need those flowering plants. The bees and bugs that pollinate also support the environmental benefits of plants, like sequestering carbon, stopping runoff from rain, as well as holding down soil and everything else that plants do for our environment. And finally, pollinators help support us. About one in three bites of food that you eat is a direct result of pollinators. Without pollinators, we wouldn't have any kinds of fruits or vegetables or anything like that. And well, that might sound appealing to some people, we do need those things in our diet to have a healthy life. So pollinators are essential parts of our ecosystems. Now, if you think about pollinators, the first thing that comes to your mind are probably bees. However, there is a little bit of confusion sometimes about what is a bee. So a bee or not a bee? It's a pretty good question. A lot of things look like bees. So we're gonna break down what is a bee, what's not, and how to tell the difference between bees and bee mimics. So this is a bee. Bees generally have lots of hair on their body. It might be completely covered or it might just be on one part like the underside or the abdomen. 
they also have relatively small compound eyes. The eyes don't take up a ton of their head. Bees will have four wings, two pairs of wings, and they'll carry pollen on their bodies. So if you see an insect that's covered in bright yellow or pink or blue, kind of like dots on it, that's it carrying pollen on its body, and it's probably a bee. One of the insects that's commonly confused for bees are wasps. Now wasps are less hairy than bees. So if you see a completely naked insect that's stripy yellow and black, it's probably a wasp. Wasps do not often carry pollen because they don't have that hair on their body. So it doesn't stick to them as well. And wasps will often have a very thin wasp waist. So that really narrow connection between their abdomen, that third section, and the thorax, that middle section on their body. Some other insects that are commonly mistaken for bees are flies. There are some flies that mimic bees almost exactly because nothing wants to eat something that can sting you. However, flies have a couple key differences. Flies will only have two wings as opposed to the four that are on bees and wasps. They'll have very thick waists. They're almost an oval shape instead of the tapered shape that bees and wasps are. They'll have very large compound eyes. The eyes will take up almost all of their head and they'll have very, very short antenna, almost more like nose hair than the long horns that you'd see on a bee or a wasp. So to practice our identification, is this a bee or a wasp or a fly? If we look at it, we can see it has two wings and very large eyes, which means that this is a fly, a transverse banded flower fly. This, is this a bee, a wasp, or a fly? If we look at this, we can see that there is very little or no hair on the body, and it has a very thin waist. So these are wasps. They're Western yellow jackets, those tiny little wasps that'll often ruin our picnics. How about this? Is this a bee, a wasp, or a fly? If we look closely, we can see it has a rather small eye. The eye doesn't take up much of the head, and it's covered in very fine yellow and white hairs. So this is a bee. It's a ligated furrow bee, one of our small solitary native bees. Finally, is this a bee, a fly, or a wasp? Now, although it's on a flower, and we can see there's some small amount of hair on it. There's also a little bit of a wasp waist that you can see. The middle section is not quite connected to the abdomen, the third section, as much as it would be on a bee. So we can say that this is a wasp. In fact, it's a large but harmless cicada killer wasp. Now with all of that information about what is a bee, you're prepared to identify bees to some extent. However, Identifying a bee down to the exact species of bee is fairly hard because in Michigan, we have over 450 species of bee and we're still identifying more. Now, the majority of these bees are solitary bees. They don't live in hives or large colonies. And in fact, many of them don't even have stingers. So the majority of bees out there are perfectly harmless. They don't have anything to protect and they have no way to hurt us. In the next several slides, we're going to look at some of our common Michigan bees that you might see in your yard and using your bee house. Now, if you think of bee, this is probably the first thing that comes to your mind, the honeybee, Apis mellifera. Now, honeybees are all one species. We only have one type of honeybee in Michigan and really in the United States. Honeybees are actually not native species. They were introduced from Europe and have since escaped into the wild and become what we call a naturalized species, meaning they can reproduce without our help. Honeybees are social bees. You've probably seen large hives of honeybees that beekeepers might have, or maybe a hive or swarm, like in the picture on the right here. These social bees have a caste system and they all need to live and work together for them to survive. Now, honeybees are pretty good pollinators, but they're not found too often in the wild. The majority are actually commercial or agricultural species. We raise honeybees in large hives that we then take to farm fields to pollinate crops 
or we'll raise them to make that really sweet honey that we like to eat. Honeybees are also the only bee that will make an appreciable amount of honey that we can harvest. Many of our native bees don't make honey at all. Now, if you don't think about a honeybee when you hear the word bee, you might think about a bumblebee. Now, bumblebees are our big, fuzzy, gentle bees, and we have about 19 different species of bumblebee in Michigan. Now, bumblebees, like honeybees, are social bees, but instead of making a large hive above ground, they'll actually nest underground. In the spring, a queen bumblebee will go find a suitable hole in a rotten log or in the ground and raise up the next generation of its hive. Now, bumblebees are also excellent pollinators. That really dense covering of hair that they have just attracts a lot of pollen to it. So you might see a bumblebee that's almost completely covered in that bright orange or yellow pollen. Bumblebees are also really good at pollination because of a special technique that they use. When bumblebees land on a large open-faced flower, they'll buzz around, stirring up a ton of pollen that then all gets stuck onto their bodies. So when they go to the next flower and do that same thing, a lot of that pollen that got stuck to them will get transferred to that flower. Now, in addition to bumblebees and honeybees, we also have many other different species of bees. Another common one that you might see are carpenter bees. In Michigan, we have two different types of carpenter bees. We have one species of large carpenter bee, which is about the size of a bumblebee or a little bit larger. It won't be covered in hair though. It'll have a black shiny abdomen. And then we have about four species of small carpenter bee, which are about a quarter inch or, or less in size. These bees are our first solitary bee species. They don't make hives and they'll live their entire lives on their own. Now carpenter bees, as their name suggests, like to nest in wood or kind of woody stems. Our large carpenter bees might bore holes in softwoods like pines or cedar, maybe the sides of a cabin or a house occasionally, but our small carpenter bees generally prefer to nest in very small holes in rotting wood or in the insides of woody stems like goldenrod or asters. Another common type of bee, and one that will probably make use of your bee house, are leafcutter bees or megachile bees. There's about 26 species of leafcutter bees in Michigan, and they are all solitary. None of them build hives. Leafcutter bees tend to nest in cavities or in holes in the ground. And you can tell that a leafcutter bee is using a cavity if it's capped with chewed leaves. So our leafcutter bees, as their name suggests, will cut parts of leaves off to seal their brood inside of these cavities. So if you see small semicircular cuts out of leaves like red buds or on soft plants like evening primrose, you'll know a leafcutter bee was there getting some nesting material for its young. On your insect hotel, look for cells or holes that have been capped with just pieces of leaf jammed in there or kind of a green paste-like material. And that'll let you know the leafcutter bees are using your insect hotel. Another common type of bee that'll use your insect hotel are mason bees or resin bees. Now we have about 30 species of mason bees in Michigan and like leafcutter bees, mason bees are solitary bees that will use your insect hotel. Mason bees generally nest in cavities. A few species will nest in the ground and they will characteristically cap cavities that they've nested in with a type of mortar or a resin. Now this mortar is made from minerals in the soil mixed with saliva and water to turn it into kind of a brick-like paste. So look for holes that have been capped with almost stone-like material. That'll let you know that mason bees are using your insect hotel. Now, mason bees are also exceptional pollinators. Some of the best pollinators in our area, actually. One blue orchard mason bee seen in the photo on top here can pollinate as many flowers as 200 honeybees in the same amount of time. This has made them so effective that some orchards have actually been using mason bees to replace honeybees for pollinating their fruit plants like cherries and apples. Another type of bee that might use your insect hotel are wool carter bees. In Michigan, we have four species of wool carter bee, but unfortunately, 
two species are what we can, would consider invasive. They are non-native species that are actually detrimental to the health of our native pollinators. Wool carter bees are again, solitary bees, like the past several species we've looked at, and they will nest in cavities. Wool carter bees have another unique way of preparing these cavities for their young. They'll line them with plant fibers, like shown in that picture, creating a kind of wool or spun cotton kind of appearance. To get these plant fibers, the wool carter bees actually have teeth on their back legs that they can use as combs to scrape the fibers off of fuzzy plants. Now, these teeth are also part of the reason why these bees are so harmful to our native bees. In true swashbuckler fashion, wool carter bees will actually use these teeth combs on their legs as almost swords to fight other bees for nesting habitat. And our native bees have no idea what's going on and will often end up on the short end of the stick um, and lose either their nesting habitat or their lives in the process. Potentially the most common non-honey bee or bumblebee type of bee that you might see are sweat bees. And that's because we have about 120 different species of sweat bee in Michigan. Now, sweat bees can be broken up into two main types. Our green sweat bees, which are the bright green metallic and striped bees that you might see flying around your flowers in the beginning of June and July. You can see two examples in the lower pictures. And then dark sweat bees or banded sweat bees, which are the darker small bees, like in the top photo there. Sweat bees are again solitary bees. They do not make large colonies. However, they will likely not use your insect hotel because the majority are ground nesting species who will lay their eggs in small holes in the ground. Now these bees that we just talked about are only a handful of the 450 different species of bees we have in Michigan. Other varieties of bees might include bees such as cellophane bees, which nest in holes in the ground, cuckoo bees, which will actually steal the nests of other bees like leafcutter and mason bees, squash bees, which although there is only one species are responsible for pollinating 99% of our squash and cucumber plants, and then minor bees, which are another ground nesting bee species. With all of these bees and our native pollinators, they need our help. Pollinators are declining for a variety of reasons but there are some very simple things that we can do to help our native pollinators who need it the most. The easiest way to help is probably to reduce or discontinue the use of pesticides in our gardens. A lot of times we'll spray for things like caterpillars or aphids that might be wanting to eat the leaves of our plants or suck some of the sap out, but these pesticides will then transfer over to our native bees and end up reducing their populations. So pesticides have their applications, but there are some other simple solutions that you could use. You could use natural pest control remedies that you might be able to find online, or you can take my favorite approach, which is a 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from whatever plants you're looking at, and generally any caterpillar damage will become invisible. Another thing we can do is to plant native plants. So our native pollinators, remember, evolved those connections with our native plants. Those are the plants that they enjoy feeding from and the ones that they help the best. So by reintroducing native plants into our landscapes, we can help those pollinators increase their numbers. Finally, you can provide nesting habitat, which is exactly what you're doing today with the insect hotel that you're gonna build. So before we build our insect hotel, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the pollination flower plants that we can use. If you're going to plant a pollinator garden with a bunch of native plants, it's best to choose plants with a variety of overlapping bloom times. So choose plants where some of them will bloom in the spring, just when the pollinators are waking up. They'll bloom throughout the summer with some different species. And then you'll have some plants that bloom in late September through October and November so that those bees that are getting ready to overwinter have a good supply of nutrients. Some of these plants that will attract a lot of pollinators include spring plants like golden alexanders, penstemon or beer tongue, and our native cherries. In the summer, you might, might wanna consider planting some swamp milkweed, some culver's root, yellow giant hyssop or bee balm. And in the fall, you can attract bees with plants such as lobelia, 
cup, plant, goldenrod, pale-leafed sunflowers, and asters. Another thing that we can do is to provide rooms for rent for these bees, or provide them with nesting habitat. To attract a variety of bees, you'll want to provide a variety of nesting habitats, because as we mentioned, your insect hotel won't support every type of bee we have. You may want to leave some stems of plants and flowers through the winter for small bees like our small carpenter bees. Trim them about 12 to 14 inches above the ground, which will get rid of all of the dead kind of growth, any dead flowers that they might have, but still leave plenty of space for those bees to winter. Provide some bare ground for bumblebees and other ground nesting species like sweat bees and cellophane bees. Provide stems or drilled blocks for cavity nesting species, such as leafcutter bees and mason bees. The insect hotel you're gonna be building today will do that perfectly. And then provide soft wood for carpenter bees so that they don't feel the temptation to burrow into your house. The best way that we've found to help these bees, as well as provide a little bit of beauty in your yard, is to make insect hotels. And these can be made from just about anything. I've seen some very ingenious ones where people will take a two by four, an untreated two by four, drill some holes in it, make a beautiful accent piece for their garden, or even make them out of tin cans and other recycled materials. However, you're going to want to do a few things such as mount whatever insect hotel you're using about three feet above the ground, preferably facing south or southeast, so it'll get the morning sun and help those pollinators wake up a little bit earlier. If you're making an insect hotel, you'll want to fill it with either drilled blocks or logs, hollow or pithy stems. Uh, pithy stems are stems of plants that are filled with a kind of spongy white material that the bees can easily take out. Cardboard or paper tubes are also perfect. Or if you want, you can just drill holes in a large block of wood. However, you'll want to avoid filling materials such as pine cones, straw, any very large holes more than say about half an inch in diameter or very long and narrow, um, slices of bark, plastic straws, or anything that will attract mold or insects and spiders that will wanna eat our native bees. Finally, you're gonna wanna actually build a smaller insect hotel as opposed to a larger one. Larger insect hotels may attract more bees, but they'll also attract more bee predators, bee parasites, and diseases that can help reduce the populations of our native bees even more. Once you put up an insect hotel, there are a few things that you'll need to do to maintain it. First is every year, you're going to want to clean out the holes on your insect hotel with a chopstick or a bottle brush and inspect materials for mold, damage, parasites, such as mites, which would be small white moving creatures, and unhatched brood or unhatched eggs. You can either clean these out using your bottle brush, or if they're in one of those cut stems in your insect hotel, just discard the stem and replace the material. Second, you're gonna wanna make sure that your hotel stays dry. On our hotel, on our hotel, we're accomplishing this using an overhanging roof. Now that you've heard me drone on for half an hour on the different bees we have and how we can help them, it's time to get to the main event, building our insect hotel. So. Let's get started. So to build your insect hotel, you're gonna to need to use all of the pieces in your kit. To start out, you're gonna to wanna to take one of these pieces with a diagonal cut on the top, and one of these smaller pieces. This is gonna be one of the sides, and this will form the bottom. To start, you wanna make sure that you're avoiding any kind of knots, because the wood might split if you try to put your screw through a knot. What you're gonna to wanna to do now is take two of your screws and put them about a finger's width from the bottom. Just start screwing in the screws on this one piece. You're going to want to stop when you see the tip come through just a little bit. That's going to help you guide the other piece of wood so that you have an easier time putting it together. So we're going to do that for both of our screws. So you can see there's just a little bit of the screw tip coming out of the wood. Then we'll take our bottom piece, line it up so that the corners of the piece line up with the corners 
of the side piece And then, you're going to screw these two pieces together. Now when you do this, you're going to want to put quite a bit of pressure onto the screws to make sure that you get a pretty tight joint. Now if your wood does start to split, if you hear a little bit of cracking, you can always take your screw out and try a different spot. The bees aren't going to care if there's a couple of extra holes in your wood. So once you have your bottom screwed on, it's okay if there's a little bit of a gap. We're going to do the same thing, but for our top. So again, we're going to line our board up with the bottom of this curve, and we're going to want to start our screw holes about a finger's width from that lowest point. Just like before, we're going to want to make sure that a little bit of our screw comes out the back of the wood so that we can easily put our top on. Remember, we just want a little bit Just like that. And then just like before, we're going to take our top, line it up with this lowest spot, and screw it in just like the bottom. And remember, you want to put some pressure on this so that the screws go in nice and easy. Like I said, if there's a little bit of a gap, that doesn't matter, the bees won't care. But if you want to get rid of that gap, just back out the screw a little bit, unscrew it about halfway, and then screw it back in. And that'll help get rid of that gap. All right, now that we have our top and our bottom attached to one of the sides, we're just going to put this face down on the table, take our other side, line it up so that all of the corners match up and then just screw it down like we did the first one putting enough pressure on the screws that it goes in nice and easy Remember, we're going to be using two screws on the bottom and two screws on the top. Now that we have our box, our next step is going to be to put the box face down and attach our little plywood back to it. So for this, you're going to want to line the back up with the bottom corners of your hotel and then put one screw on each side. That's all you'll need to hold this on is one screw on each side. I recommend putting the screws into the sides. You could do the top and bottom also, but the sides have a little bit more room, so you don't need to worry about accidentally hitting another screw that you've put in. Alright, 
now that we've got our back on, our sides and our top and bottom, we can take our roof, which is the aged weathered board. Now this will, being aged, will help the board actually survive longer outside and give the hotel a nice look. And you should have at least one angle cut, probably two. When you put this roof on, you're going to want to make sure that that angled cut lines up with the back of the hotel. If you've got that angle all set, you'll have four holes on the top of your roof, and those will help the screws go in a little bit easier through this really hard, tough wood. So just put one screw in each of those holes, Again, using just enough pressure to get it through the wood nice and easy. Screw the roof down to the rest of the insect hotel. If you want to see if your roof is on right, just look for an overhang on the front of the hotel. If there's an inch or two of overhang, your roof's on great, and it work great to protect all of the materials and bees inside of your insect hotel. Now that we've got the entire box assembled, the sides, the back, the top and bottom, and the roof, we can fill our insect hotel with the materials that came in your kit. You should have two drilled blocks, one with quarter inch holes and one with 5 16 inch holes. And your insect hotel should be just wide enough for these to slide in with a tiny bit of wiggle room. You should also have a bundle of stems. Yours is probably tied with a little bit of twine, but if they've fallen out, that's fine. What we're going to do with the stems is just add them to the empty space in your insect hotel. And this will provide a variety of nesting habitats for our bees. Some bees will use the drilled blocks, whereas others will prefer to nest in the cut stems. Now, I put the drill blocks on the bottom to make it a little bit easier on myself to fit all this material. However, you can arrange this however you'd like. You can put the drill blocks on the bottom, on the top. You can put them in the uh, stems between the drill blocks. All of these configurations are perfectly fine. The bees will not care whether or not your insect hotel matches mine exactly. So once you have all of your items in your insect hotel, you're all done. You've created an amazing nest box for our solitary bees, our best pollinators. And I hope that when you put this in your yard, you get to enjoy the diversity of bee species that we have in Michigan. And maybe start counting and identifying the bees that you find using your house. Thank you again for your interest in our Build a Native Pollinator Hotel program. If you have any questions about your hotel or anything that you saw in this program, please feel free to email us at natureducation at oakgov.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can with an answer to your question. If you're interested in more programs, please keep an eye on our website and our social media pages for upcoming events and programs. Be sure to check our website as well for updated nature center hours and park amenities. And until next time, stay safe, get outside, and enjoy your new insect hotel.